The Lord be with you. Uh, we rejoice uh, in that greeting and yeah. that celebration that indeed God is with us. Uh, that God comes to us this morning in His Word. That uh, God is coming to hundreds this morning uh, in baptism. Uh, and we come to the Lord in response to what God does for us in our worship and our praise and our prayers and our thanksgiving. And we celebrate that this morning. A special welcome to our guests who have joined us for worship this morning. We would be privileged if you would use one of the information cards in your pew to share more about your stuff, uh, that we then in turn can share more about the programs and ministry for our congregation. In the back of your bulletin, you'll find our announcements, and there's a lot going on as always. We certainly invite you to uh, check those announcements out, and more than that, to, to find those opportunities where uh, God can serve you and you can serve the Lord, and not just on Sunday morning, but uh, each and every day. You'll find lots of opportunities for of service, or fellowship, or Bible study, uh, many different ways that we serve the Lord uh, throughout the week, and that God serves us. But I want to ask you a special invitation following our worship services this morning, both here and uh, as well in our contemporary worship service that is going on next door at the same time. But following our worship services, our youth are hosting uh, our taco lunch. Uh, it's sort of taco in a bag, and you'll love them there. They're a really neat concept. Uh, that is in support of uh, their trip to the National Youth Gathering in New Orleans this summer. Uh, they're getting very close to their fundraising goal, and thank you for all the support uh, to date. We invite you to join us for that uh, lunch on worship. Also, I know they have a number of us, uh, flowers for sale. A number of us are doing, uh, I don't know about you, but I know we're doing a lot of uh, planting around our house that we seem to be past frost season, I hope. Um, and so they've got lots of flowers and some vegetables as well if you're interested in purchasing um, those as well. Uh, I'd also like to, to, to welcome this morning a, a special guest who will also be with us for lunch. Uh, and that is uh, President Derek Lee Cakes, uh, who is president of the Atlantic District of the Lutheran Church of the Missouri Synod. He is essentially bishop. Uh, is one way to refer to him that he's the bishop of the diocese and he's familiar with a, a Catholic model of organization. He's showing I lost him. No, actually, he's uh, next door. Uh, we've organized our worship services, so the sermon is at the beginning of the service next door, so he can preach there. Uh, we'll run over, quick uh, vest up, and then join us. So, somebody who looks a whole lot like me, in fact, we're often confused uh, uh, as brothers. Um, we'll be sliding into his spot about halfway through the service, and um, we're thankful for his presence. And again, he'll be available for, uh, with us during uh, our fellowship hour. You'll also be receiving from the usher on the way out uh, our recent uh, magazine, a publication uh, from the Atlantic District, the Atlantic District Mission Society. This is a, a publication that they put out uh, about quarterly. Uh, we have different opportunities and things going on in the district, and if you notice, on the inside page, or maybe some people you know. Uh, there's a nice article about our congregation uh, and what we do in terms of our mission trips. So, uh, a nice picture of Eric Jarabek right there. Um, you see Jesse Wilson and Jim Athene, uh, and a bunch of wonderful pictures. So, uh, certainly uh, invite you to check that out. There's lots of other uh, things in there as well. This morning, uh, as we gather, this morning it is Trinity Sunday. It's the Sunday that uh, follows the, the celebration of, of Pentecost. It's the day that we remember who God is. Um, Hunter is about to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's how God uh, is and how God reveals himself, not just his name, but God is substance. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He calls us to, to worship him as such, to, to go out and baptize in his name, and so we do that this morning. We celebrate God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our worship service is printed out for us in our bulletin. Our hymns are in our hymnal, including our opening <coughs> hymn, Come Thou, Almighty King, hymn number 905. Uh, indeed, we begin in God's name, the name in which uh, he reveals himself, uh, the name in which he has baptized us. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You may be seated or kneel for confession.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve I like that. <laughs> Greetings to you. Greetings to you on behalf of the Atlantic District. You know, that doesn't quite sound right. How can a district be, bring greetings? So, greetings to you from far reaches, from Canada, from, or from the, the border with Canada, down through the Adirondacks, this is our district, down through uh, the capital region of which you're familiar, through the Hudson Valley, the five boroughs of New York, and both Nassau and Suffolk counties of Long Island. 
You know, that doesn't work either. It gives you an idea of the geography, but really it's the people, the 100 churches, the 34, inst- uh, 34 educational institutions, the one college, four high schools, our 30, uh, 30 or so RSOs or social ministries that are active. But that doesn't work either for me. It's really the people. The people of God that are in those places that are being affected by the love of Jesus Christ. The people of God that are gathering today together, that are coming and receiving the Lord, His grace, His mercy. It's those people in those places, the members of the Atlantic District of which you are a part. I was going to say, so you bring us greetings from ourselves. From yourself. Thank God for that. (laughs) Would you stop interrupting me? (laughs) I was on a flow there. That was good. It's really hard to go from one place to the other and still know what's going on, but it's all right. From all those people, the people that are just like you, scattered throughout our district, a district which speaks in 12 different languages, the gospel on a given Sunday, a district which just shares the love of Christ with about 8% of the United States population. For me, it's just, let me leave it there. Welcome. It's good to be here. For me, it's neat to be here at Bethlehem. I've been here before. Uh, I love the, the fact that I served just over in Iskuna and, and we had the opportunity to, to be a part of different Lenten services and the like. For me, even in the past, with Sunrise and other places. And so let me start with one of those stories. While I was at Sunrise, I was the, one of the directors up there. And one of my jobs there was to work with the college students. And when the college students came during the summer, they were scattered from across the nation. So one of my jobs was to bring them and make them a cohesive unit, a cohesive group that could work forward in faith. It can be a challenging thing to work with college students, especially when you're only given two weeks to make them be a cohesive group. But with that, we would go through a lot of challenge exercises, different activities that were formed to to build the team together and, and move forward together in that way. Part of that was a trust exercises, and you've probably heard of trust falls in, in the past. So you, you get up on a platform that's about uh, four feet off the ground, you turn with your back to a bunch of people that have their arms out, and you just fall back into their arms. Some people got up like that, without a problem. They would just get up, they'd fall back, you'd almost not be ready, almost drop them, but you would catch them, and it was this wonderful activity. But there'd always be some. There would always be some, and normally they were the bigger guys, the strong, mighty ones. They would climb up on this platform. They would put their hands together, and they would stand there. And they would stand there, and they'd stand there. They'd look over their shoulder to make sure that people were actually going to catch them. And then finally, most of the time, they would fall. But that pause, that pause was a question of trust. Do I actually trust them to be there? Do Even though I've seen it over and over again, I've witnessed it myself, are they going to catch me? Are they going to be there for me? I think that question of trust, that question of being there for someone, happens to us as well. Think about your faith. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Here we are in church. So I make some assumptions about what you believe. I make some assumptions like, before I got here, there was a baptism at the baptismal font. A good one. I'm glad it was a good one. I'm sorry I missed it. But right there at the font, the beauty of God at work, right there, through the word, through the water, in the life of that infant, we believe that the Spirit made himself known in that heart. What an incredible miracle of God. You've called on the name of God. You've been here. You called on him as a part of the baptism. You called on him as you invoked his name, as you began. When you said the words of the confession and absolution, I assume you listed your sins before God. And when you heard the words of the absolution from my brother, you heard the forgiveness of sins proclaimed to you. That's the reality of what we believe, the reality of who we are and whose we are. But sometimes I wonder... Do we actually believe it? You see, that's what the people of Israel were dealing with during the epistle lesson. When Peter is speaking and he calls on the the people of Israel, he is asking them questions. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works 
and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I love scripture. Not always the easiest thing to understand the the argument or, or the flow of the words. So this is the way I read those words. In essence, Peter says, people of Israel, listen up. People of Israel, what you did, you saw the work of God. You saw Jesus in your midst. You saw the miracles he did. You saw the people he affected. You saw all of these things. You know that he was the Messiah. No one could have done the things that he did. And yet, you let him be crucified. You let him die. And you were either part of it or you let it happen. You didn't trust that he was who he said he was. You didn't know that he was there for you. They knew. They knew who he was, but didn't trust enough to do anything about it. What about you? Are those words just for the people of Israel, or do those words have some meaning for us today? Because I think these words speak directly to each and every one of us. Listen to it this way. People of Bethlehem, Delmar, Jesus The man you know that God shared with you, that did mighty works and wonders and signs in your midst, as you yourselves already know. We talked about baptism and how Jesus is active there in the water. We talked about the Lord's Supper where Jesus gives us his very body and blood. These are acts of God. Every day, every time we come forward and we receive that, we see the hand of God being offered out to us. His body, His blood, the forgiveness of real sins. This isn't just things we talk about. This is the realness of our faith. Forgiveness of sins which is freely offered through confession and absolution. You are these witnesses. The witnesses that Peter talks about. You are the ones who have seen these things. This Jesus, delivered up according to to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I don't know about you. That idea of putting Jesus on the cross kind of bothers me. When I look at my life, when I look at the things I do, the reality of that, though, comes to home. When I leave this place, when I get on the throughway and head back to Niskuna to spend time with my family, I will bet that someone in that route will cut me off. I'll be driving along, just minding my own business, driving like the perfect driver I am. <laughs> and someone, some idiot, insane person, will come flying up the side and just veer, try to veer into my car. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Well, if you're anything like me, when that happens, your face gets bright red and certain thoughts pop into your mind. Does that happen to you? Well, for me, those thoughts are always, Jesus loves you. (laughs) I don't know what your thoughts are. (laughs) Sadly, I wish that were true. Far too often, there are different thoughts. I know that as this week goes on, that, that my children at some point will frustrate me. I have three daughters, all of, te- all of whom are teenagers. They will frustrate me just a little bit. I know sometime during this week that there'll be some issue that, is, that comes up between my wife and myself. Anger, frustration, loss, separation. We understand the world. We understand ourselves. We understand the sin that is a part of us. The realness of life that is there in our hearts. Doesn't mean we can't overcome it through Christ. But we know that it's there. It's those very sins. Not just the gross sins of murder and war and angst. 
It's these very little sins that are a part of our lives that Jesus goes to the cross and dies for. It's these, these sins that are a part of me that Christ makes a decision to go to the cross for me, to give His life for me, to offer forgiveness to me. It's not based on who I am or what I've done, but it's based on His love. His love for me. To me, that's the beauty of faith. The beauty of the God that we believe in, the beauty of the faith that we profess, is that in spite of my sin, Jesus' love is there for me. That He has done His work on my behalf. I didn't ask Him. He simply loved me that much. That is the witness to which we attest. That is the work that God has done on our behalf. That is what we witness to the world. See, the beauty of our faith is that God is a part of us. That as we come and we receive holy baptism, we are baptized into the faith and the Spirit makes us indwelling. The beauty of it as we come forward, receive Christ's body and blood from His altar, God inhabits us. That as we go out into the world, God is a part of us. We are the ones who make a difference in the world. God promises us that He comes to us through water, through word, through His body and blood. God comes to us comes and lives and dwells in us. We are a part of this union with God. And then as we go out from out those doors, as we go out into the world, we share Christ with all we meet. Peter says that. Peter goes on and he talks about how David knew about the Messiah that would come. He talks about the Trinity in like the third or fourth paragraph. He talks about what the Father does, the Son does, and the Spirit does. One God and three persons. But then he goes on and he says why this matters. It's the last verse of the reading. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Go and tell people. That's what Peter tells us. Go let them know the certainty of your faith. Go let them know what Jesus has done for you. Go let them know this love that you have experienced. Go and tell others about Jesus. It's the simplest of messages. Go tell them what he has done in your life. We live in a world not unlike that of Israel back in the day. We live in a world that questions faith. We live in a world that seems lost and without hope. We live in a world that doesn't seem to want to know anything about anything. We live in a world where we see politicians that go at one another's throats every day on TV and the radio. A place where we lost respect. And I would say we've lost hope. That's the world that Peter steps into. That's the world that Peter says, this is what Jesus stands for. This is the love that he has to offer to you. Telling people about Jesus. You might think to yourself, Pastor, I'm not ready to do that. I don't know how I would do that. And I'd say you're wrong. It's the simplest of things to do. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be any special person. Peter says this to everyone in the crowd. Go tell them what you've seen, what you've heard, and who you are. Colossians 3.17, Paul talks there. And he writes, whatever you do, in word or deed... Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, in your words and in your actions, as you go from the church, carry Christ with you. And remember, that is reflected in everything you do, in everything you are, in the relationships you have, in the friends you meet the friends you make, the way you interact with the people on the street, the way you interact with other drivers the way you interact with the people at the grocery store, in each and every one of those places, you bring Jesus with you. Whatever you do, people of Bethlehem Delmar, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through Him. May you, as a people called by God, Share that love, that forgiveness that he has given you with the world around you. To Christ be the glory.
Amen. Amen.